This is Dan Schneider, and on this Dan Schneider video interview, I have four men who have alternative views of the origin of the universe. They will present their views, they will debate with each other, and that will be coming up in a moment. So we'll be going in alphabetical order in terms of which man will give his idea of the universe first, and then we'll receive questions from the other, uh, and also on how they will present uh, their ideas. First up is Howard Bloom. I have interviewed Howard two other times before, 12 years ago, on my Omniverska radio, internet radio show, and then also once in my Dan Schneider uh, written interview. Howard, if you could just briefly uh, introduce yourself and give uh, a few minutes on your idea or your model of the universe. Okay, my name is Howard Bloom. <laughs> That's the easy part. Now for the hard part. I'm the author of six books. Um, one of those books, the second one, Global Brain, The Evolution of Mass Mind from the Big Bang to the 21st Century, was the subject of a seminar put together by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And they included in that seminar people from the State Department, the Energy Department, DARPA, IBM, and MIT. Some of them were flown in from Boston and from uh, California. Um, the... Um, I've, I've been the founder of several groups. One of them is the Space Development Steering Committee, which includes Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon, people from NASA, the National Science Foundation, and the National Space Society. I'm on the board and the board of directors, uh, actually the board of governors and the board of directors of the National Space Society. And I'm designing right now, I'm co-designing, a multi-planetary mission at Caltech for the Keck Institute for Space Studies. Um, the alternative theory of the universe has a strange, my alternative theory of the universe has a, a strange background story. The year was uh, 1955. I was 12 years old. My mom had somehow managed to get me a meeting with the head of the graduate physics department at the University of Buffalo. I had been into microbiology and theoretical physics since I was 10 years old. It was probably going to be a five minute meeting because what does the head of a graduate physics department have to do with a 12-year-old? And it turned out to be a one-hour meeting because we were discussing interpretations of the Doppler shift and specifically the interpretations that led to the Big Bang Theory. Now, in reality, uh, Fred Hoyle, the man who was responsible for steady state theory, that very year was absolutely certain it was the year he was going to destroy Big Bang Theory and we would never hear of Big Bang Theory again. A few years later, 1959, I was 16, and I was working in the world's largest cancer research facility, allegedly working on pioneering research on immunology. But that wasn't what interested me. What really interested me was something called the CPT problem, the charge parity time problem. If, and here's the problem. If matter and antimatter are created in equal amounts at the same time, why is there so much matter in this universe and so little antimatter? It took me two and a half months to figure out a solution to that one. And the solution was a bloom toroidal model. A torus is a donut. Um, now it's called the big bagel model of the universe. And it works like this. Imagine an infinitesimally tiny, tiny hole at the center of the bagel. You know, one of those irritating bagels that doesn't have a real hole? Um, at the instant of the big bang, the matter universe, our universe, the one we're familiar with, comes popping out at the top. The antimatter universe, in, a, in an equal bag, Big Bang, comes popping out of the bottom. The two universes move at very high speed. How can you tell? Because the shape of the bagel, the sides are steep, coming out of the hole. And the curve represents energy. The curve represents motion. So they're moving at very high speed. And then they taper off in speed as they get up to this sort of placid, to use Terry's or, or David's term, as they get up to the top and the bottom where things smooth out. And then guess what happens? Then they begin to accelerate toward each other again, drawn by a common language. And that common language is gravity. So they increase in speed as they go down the downside, the outer side of the bagel, until finally they meet at the bagel's edge and annihilate each other in a flash of energy that is, guess what? The next singularity, the next hole at the beginning of the big, big bagel. So it's what um, I think was Terry of the universe. And that's basically it. So what were the predictions that it made in 1959? One, that coming out of the Big Bang, the speed at which the universe expanded would be extremely rapid. Um, in 1982, when Alan Guth presented 
his theory of inflation, that's exactly what Guth was proposing. And then in 1998, 38 years after the generation of this theory, we discovered something utterly shocking, that after a certain point, the universe doesn't begin to slow down, it begins to speed up, it begins to accelerate. Now, since to accelerate you need energy, uh, we guessed, we hypothesized, we imagined, we fantasized an energy source. We called it dark energy. Dark simply means in physics, I don't know, I don't understand. But the big bagel model gives you a clear explanation of why the universe would be accelerating because the negative, the antimatter universe and the universe, the normal universe have run out of energy, begun to sense each other's gravity and like a descending cannonball at the end of a parabolic arc, have begun to speed faster and faster toward each other. So those are two predictions the theory made. I threw the theory away thinking that if I was 16 years old and the theory was so simple, I could make more science, not real science. But then when the predictions started to come true, I had to take my own theory seriously again. So if you look up Big Bagel, Howard Bloom, and YouTube, uh, you'll find an animation of the theory, and that animation has had about 795,000 hits, moving up toward 800,000 hits. Now, all of us, David, Terry, not Lynn, uh, we all have a similar problem. Two of us, three of us are not part of the scientific establishment. Um, we don't have the right credentials to present our theories. And each of us has gone to great length and spent many years developing uh, a really admirable theory, an alternative theory. So our problem is that we're outsiders. Only Ling is an insider. He has an academic position. He publishes in peer-reviewed journals. My theory was published in the Journal of Space Philosophy, which is a peer-reviewed journal, but it's certainly not nature or science. Okay. That's the whole thing. All right, thank you, Howard. Uh, up next is David Noel. David, if you could introduce yourself and talk about your uh, model of the universe. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is David Noel. Uh, I live in Perth, Western Australia, but I was born and brought up in Brit Britain, and I have a science degree from Cambridge University. For pretty much all of my life, I've been interested in how the world works. Not just the scientific side, but also how society works, uh, how people interact to get the results we see around us. <clears throat> Over the years, I've got in the habit of analysing what's called the conventional wisdom. What we're generally told are the views of the experts on all sorts of topics. Now, I'm continually surprised to find out how many of these views, how much of the conventional wisdom we rely upon, is wrong. Sometimes completely wrong, more often just skewed because one of the underlying assumptions that the views rely on is wrong. You'll find my thoughts on various topics up on my website, aoi.com.au. Mnemonic is always of interest, although that wasn't the origin, uh, origin of the site name. Here's a little advert for, for the site. Uh, now, for a, a sample of some of the worst misconceptions current, look at the Occamai's universe uh, on AOI. This has stuff on the physical cosmos. It's intended for any interested people and isn't very technical uh, or complex. Now, here today specifically, we're talk, talking about origins of the universe, and uh, <coughs> my model is called uh, the Placid Universe model, and essentially it's extremely simple. Uh, it's uh, what I call Occamized, which means that uh, we've used o uh, Occam's uh, razor, which is a principle which says uh, if you're presented with various alternative possibilities, you should always take the simplest. It was invented by William of Ockham, who was a, a monk. Uh, an English monk in the 1300s, but it's got tremendous application over uh, any uh, position where you have to decide between different alternatives. And the Placid Universe model is completely simple. Uh, it says it's infinite in space and time, and so it has no creation time, there is no expansion, uh, it's pretty much uh, the same from one millennium to 
the next uh, uh, and uh, uh, it rules out the Big Bang Theory because there's no reason for it. Now there's a, a, a couple of uh, a couple of major problems with the Big Bang, which I, I'll just go into here. Uh, it's really one of the major mistakes in science, and I'll, I'll point out uh, two assertions which are, are, are just plain wrong. Uh, one of them is common sense, and the other is more science. Now, the common sense item is, uh, according to the Big Bang theory, the universe exploded out of pretty well nothing uh, from a small point around 14 billion years ago and it's been expanding ever since. Now if this is really true then if we look back at the universe as it was in the past then it should be more tightly packed than it is now. And we can do this because the light we see in our telescopes uh, from distant objects started off well back in the past. So we look at a galaxies, a galaxies from about uh, 7 billion years ago. The light which we see from them started off 7 billion years ago. The images we see, which they're of the universe at the time which the Big Bang is, I think is half the age of the universe, uh, are not showing any compression. If the Big Bang theory was correct, these ancient galaxies, which should be packed together uh, twice as tightly as they are now in the closer, much younger universe. Now, they aren't. Even out to 10 billion or more light years, which is uh, about three quarters of what the Big Bang says say is the unit age of the universe, uh, the images you get, like the Hubble deep field images from the Hubble telescope, <coughs> show a packing which is pretty much just like uh, the closer galaxies, those who are closer to the times. So uh, that's a common sense item <coughs> which relates to how closely the galaxies are packed. Now the, the root science item, <coughs> there's a, a basic scientific law called the law of conservation of mass energy and that states that the mass uh, and energy uh, in the universe can be converted to other forms but can't be created or destroyed. That's a basic part of physics. You can't create or destroy matter or energy. Uh, you can convert them uh, into different forms and you can convert them into each other but you can't uh, create from nothing. Now, no instance has ever been found in science where the law is not obeyed. It's one of the basics. And yet, the big theory completely contra contravenes this fundamental law. It tells us that matter and energy have been created from nothing and are continuing to be created. So, in, in a way, it's astonishing that some people who call themselves uh, professional scientists can accept the law of conservation and still believe in the Big Bang. <coughs> now, there's, there's many other reasons which uh, show that the Big Bang theory is wrong. Uh, one of the particular papers I've got on this, articles up, is this one here. Uh, R.I.P. Expanding Universe. Can you hold it up a little and higher? You that, that paper? Did you have a? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. R.I.P. Expanding. R.I.P. Expanding Universe, and uh, <coughs> that gives a more detailed and scientific evaluation. So that that's pretty much the position that it stands. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, David. Uh, third uh, up alphabetically is Ling Jun Wang, and he has. Another alternative modeling. Okay, then do I uh, just give a two minute of? Uh, you, no, for, first just uh, give, give, yeah, yeah, right on yourself, and then then. Uh, I'll go ahead uh, with my twenty minutes uh, presentation. You uh, just t tell people who you are, and then uh, talk a bit about your your idea of, 
uh, your theory. Okay, I, I have 20 minutes, right? No, no. Uh, no? You, it, it's what? 20 minutes for everyone to introduce their theory. So uh, just p please tell us uh, who you are, you know, give, give a minute or two on your background, and then uh, five or six minutes, what, whatever you need to just talk about your theory. Like an outline. Yeah. Five or six minutes? Yeah. J j just as David and Howard did. Just, uh, just about. I thought I have 20 minutes. Okay, uh, whatever. Okay. Um, I, I'm a professor um, in the um, physics department of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Um, I published my DET theory in the year of 20, uh, 2005 in physics thesis. Uh, it's, it stands for dispersive extinction theory. It's a different interpretation of the Hubble law. Okay. Uh, from that uh, into different interpretation, uh, my theory will allow an infinite universe. No beginning, no ending, and it's stable. And there's no ad hoc hypothesis. Um, and no problems, no fundamental paradoxes, such as the uh, violation of uh, conservation law of mass and energy, uh, horizon problem, uh, geocentric nature, and extreme instability, none of these. And there are new physics in my theory. Uh, DT theory predicts that the cosmic redshift not only depends on the distance of the heavenly body from the Earth, but also proportional to the square of the line width, and inversely proportional to the cube of the uh, wavelength. And these are the physics not known before the publication of my uh, paper. Um, I have a detailed presentation later after the introduction. Is that good? Yes, uh, we, and we will have links to all four of your websites and uh, uh, things be below the video. So uh, I, I, are you resting on that? So you, that you, you're, you're yeah, you give me a chance to give my presentation, right? Yes, you will. Every, everyone will have uh, there will be questions. You, you can give a, a little bit further uh, explanation when it's your turn to be questioned by the other three. So thank okay. you, Ling Jun. Uh, yeah. the, the fourth. The fourth person to present his theory is Terry Witt, Terrence Witt. I had interviewed uh, also like Howard Bloom for my written version of my interview series, and his theory is null physics. So, Terry, if you could introduce yourself and your idea. Okay, my name is Terrence Witt. Uh, by formal training, I'm an electrical computer engineer. I ran a biophysics and biomedical company for 15 years, which became the world leader in cardiac analysis. But originally, when I was in college, back in the day, I started out in physics, and that was has always been my, my passion, my, my drive. And that was around 1970s, where string theory was starting to fester. The Big Bang had been rolling along for quite a while. And once I got in education, I noticed how ossified and fractured and political, even in the 1970s, that physics had become, and I really didn't want any part of it. So I went into computer engineering, and then once I had developed later in my life, I decided, well, let's see if we can fix some of these problems. And so I published Null Physics in 2007, and it's a unified field theory. It touches on everything as a unified field theory should do. But it has a real strong cosmology section. And in the cosmology section, again, uh, like David and like Ling Jun, um, it, it deals with a quiescent universe, um, a non-expanding universe, a universe that is very, very stable in equilibrium. But what it also does is it quantifies and it shows the entire cosmic engine, if you will. It shows how that happens, because if you're going to say the universe is quiescent, then you've got some explaining to do. Because the bottom line is the Big Bang, even though it is ridiculous, it is a fable, it is wildly inconsistent with several observations, not falsifiable. One of the basic things about science 
something has to be falsifiable. The Big Bang is not. If something doesn't match the Big Bang, then we create something like relic neutrinos or we create inflation or we create dark energy so that it will fit the data. That is not science. So it is not falsifiable and that's, that is a huge problem. And it is not predictive. The Big Bang looks for things that might match. It does not predict galactic properties. It does not predict anything. In fact, the original radiation field, when they're saying, oh, we found the microwaves, that's, that's the leftover, that's the remnant from the Big Bang. Well, they couldn't predict that within 10 degrees. Now, now many years later, we know it's 2.7 degrees, and so everybody's tweaked everything. It's like, okay, everything matches now. That's not science. Okay, no cosmology is science. I take the crescent universe, and I explain there are three big problems that you're going to deal with. If you're going to say the universe doesn't expand, if you're going to say the universe doesn't change, then you've got the redshift to deal with. Okay, and it is not a scattering phenomenon. It's a very specific. It looks exactly like a Doppler shift, but it is not. The other thing you need to explain is you look out into space, and everything you see is around 15 billion years old. It's not 10 billion, it's not 25, it's around 15 billion years old. So if the universe has been around forever, why does everything look like it's the same age? Or right around that. Okay, and the third thing is the microwaves. That's a huge thing to explain because in all cosmology, one thing that's typical is the, the accuracy of the measurements are horrible. The Hubble constant it could be plus or minus 50%. The uh, average density of the universe, plus or minus 100%. Those cosmic microwaves, we know those to several decimal places. That is the most accurate piece of cosmic evidence that we've got, okay? And the problem is, if you look at a star or you look at a galaxy, those things are pumping out huge amounts of ultraviolet radiation, huge amounts. If you look at our sun, it puts out two or three parts per million microwaves, okay? So we've got this whole universe blazing away in ultraviolet, but yet when you look at the kind of radiation we have coming from deep space, the microwave radiation is 20 times the density of this integrated starlight. Basically, that's the term for you know, all, the, all the light that's leaving all the galaxies. We call it the integrated starlight. So now we're, we're said, okay, well, we've got contemporary objects, the galaxies that don't produce microwaves, but yet we've got all these huge density of microwaves in deep space. So we've got some explaining to do. It's like, well, where did all this microwave energy come from? And of course, the Big Bang says, well, it came from back in the day. And it did not. No, so you've got, so if you're going to say quiescent universe, you've got some three very large things you have to deal with. And that's what no cosmology does. And in one paradigm, it not only deals with the redshift, the microwaves, the apparent universal age, but it quantifies the process. It actually looks because, again, the universe isn't changing. We've got a lot of stars out there burning a hell of a lot of hydrogen, and they're making a hell of a lot of helium and heavier elements. If the universe has been here forever, we're going to have a lot of helium and heavier elements. There has to be a stability. And so there has to be processes in place in the universe to undo that nucleosynthesis. And the bigger trick is, okay, we've got all this radiation going into space. <clears throat> now, back in the day, there was something called Olber's Paradox. That was where they said, well, if the universe was infinite, and again, this is something you have to deal with if you've got an infinite quiescent universe. If the universe is infinite, then if I shoot a, a vector, a line out, any direction, sooner or later it's going to run into the surface of a star because you've got an unbounded space. So the original Olber's paradox was saying, well, why is the sky black instead of white? Because if the universe is infinite, there'll be nothing but stars out there. Well, then they said, well, yeah, you've got scattering and you've got a mean, mean path before light would strike that surface. And, and so you've got diffusion and you've got all these effects. But your issue is, okay, so forget all that. You've still got stars pumping energy into the universe. If the universe is not expanding, 
all this energy gets to keep pumping into the universe, it's going to, the universe will die heat death. And so these are all issues that the Big Bang has tried to address. It asks, you know, as an expansion, okay, we get cool. Now, I'm not saying the Big Bang is right. The Big Bang is as wrong as lug nuts on a birthday cake, okay? It is completely wrong. It is flat earth wrong, okay? But what I am saying is there's some serious challenges when it comes to measurements that a cos cosmology has to deal with. And that's what I did in my book. That's why there are equations in it. That's why there are graphs in it. And it takes about even an abbreviated uh, presentation, which I thought, as uh, Ling Jan was saying, um, I thought we were going to get 20 or 30 minutes. <clears throat> that's why I brought up a PowerPoint that is like a 30-minute presentation. Usually it takes two hours to present all the details and the other bits in my theory. But it shows how the whole cosmic engine works. It shows where the energy, how when you create, you've got all this fusion. You, you use, you, so you need fuel. The universe is a big engine. It needs all this hydrogen, right? And it creates compound nuclei and radiation. And somehow all that stuff, the compound nuclei and the radiation energy, get recombined to produce more hydrogen so the cycle goes over and over again. And if you look at galaxies and you really understand what a galaxy is, it's all happening in galaxies. That's what a galaxy is. A galaxy is the universe's basically recycling engine. And so I can give you a very uh, very brief situation. So the three things we're talking about, the redshift, wow, it's, um, it's a very unique thing, looks just like a Doppler shift. Well, everybody's so worried about the universe is flying apart, the universe is flying apart, it's expanding. What they don't get is it is energy loss. It is a huge energy loss because in 10 billion years and light years, you have photons that lose half of their energy. So imagine the entire luminous output of our universe every 10 billion years, which is less than the lifespan of the sun, every 10 billion years it gets cut in half. Well, where's that energy go? That's a huge amount of energy. If you've got an equilibrium system, you've got a fire burning, and all this energy is going somewhere, and you need to account for that. Well, I'll tell you where it goes. The redshift energy goes by decay, by actually photonic decay, that gets dumped into the microwave background. That's why there's 20 times more microwave energy than integrated starlight. And like, okay, well, then you have the equilibrium. Okay, so now you've got this huge microwave. In fact, if you look at the energy density in the microwave and you look at how much, it's called luminosity density. That's how many watts per cubic meter stars overall produce into space. It's, it's <laughs> tiny. Space is huge. Space is empty. The luminosity density, which is measured, is about 10 to the negative 33 watts per cubic meter. So that's minuscule. It is so small that if you stripped away the cosmic microwaves, if you could just somehow blank out the entire cosmic microwaves, it would take our universe 940 billion years to replace that energy. So what that's, what's that telling you for the David and Ling Jun that are proponents of the quiescent universe? That microwave energy field is nearly a trillion years old on average. That's how old it is, okay? And so now you've got this thing, so follow the energy. Okay, so we've got this energy going into the microwave field. And you can debate how the decay photons are emitted. I've got all the details in my book, but it's in there. Now you've still got a problem. Where does it go from there? Well, the only place where it can go from there, it's filling up all of space. There's cosmic microwaves in every corner of the universe. It has to go back into the galactic systems. There's no other place for it to go. Okay, so we've got a trillion years worth of energy here. We're dumping more energy into it. As the stars burn throughout space, we keep dumping energy into this. Something has to get that energy back to complete this cosmic equilibrium. So that energy needs to come back into those galaxies so we can combine it with this really cool compound nuclei, carbon and nitrogen and all the good stuff, and burn it all the way back into hydrogen. And then we've got more and more hydrogen make more stars to make more eternal. It is a engine. Okay, so a lot of microwaves there. How do we get it back into the galaxies? 
Well, galaxies have a bright, shiny cool spot about 100 to 120,000 light years in diameter. The galactic disk, and I'm going to use, in fact, spiral galaxies are the archetypical perfect example of what I'm talking about because you can look right at them and you'll know exactly kind of like an aha moment. Okay, so we've got a spiral galaxy. It's about 120,000 light years in diameter. Outside of that spiral galaxy, and it has been measured, it's called a dark halo. The dark halo of these galaxies is about 10 to 20 times larger than the actual galaxy. So if you look at the dark halo of the Milky Way, for instance, it's going to be on the order of 2 million light years in diameter. Huge dark halo. Now this is just dark, cold material. But what it is also is ionized at extremely low temperature, that would be around 3 degrees Kelvin, and it's got a huge amount of microwaves going through it. So what that is, is a basic galactic, galactic sized <coughs> microwave antenna. All these microwaves, so in the equilibrium system, what we have in our universe is you build up the microwaves to a density such that when they're passing through these galactic halos, it becomes a microwave antenna. And so that's the end of the electromagnetic energy. Now we've got electrical energy because it's an antenna with microwaves passing through it. And so that electrical energy we see every day when we look at a Hubble telescope of a spiral galaxy because those big bands that you see, those big beautiful bands in a spiral galaxy is electrical current. And that electrical current is coming from the dark halo. And we know this because if you look at the cosmic microwaves, the only correlation they have to the visible universe. So if you were to take that big W map image and you overlay it onto the visible universe, there's no correlation at all. You've got the stippling about 18 to 20 micro Kelvin stippling through it. But what you will have is places where the two connect up. So now, but Terry, you've got Terry, the most, Terry can, say I, again? Can, can you just wrap up in a minute or two? Yeah, I am wrapping up. Okay. So. So those places where it connects up, the microwave radiation is cooler. It's a little less than 2.7, which means that's where it's getting drawn down to go back into the galaxies. The currents go all the way to the core, the galactic core, and that current plus is basically the energy returning to the galaxy, and now it needs to be combined with compound nuclei, and that's what happens in the core. And the only way to do that because we've got a big galactic disk, it's for the galaxy to be a vortex. So that's why galaxies look like a vortex, because they are. All of the galactic material falls into the core, it's combined with the electrical current, and it's burned back into hydrogen, and that's why you see jets of hydrogen coming out of the active galactic nuclei and a flow of hydrogen coming out of our core. And that is how the cosmic engine works, and our entire solar system is falling on average towards this core at 1.6 kilometers per second. We'll be there in about 4 billion years. It's 25,000 light years away. So that's prediction and falsifiability. If there's no galactic vortex, my theory's wrong. So my theory predicts quantitatively falsifies. That's what science is supposed to be. That's All right. It. All right. Thank you, Terry. So that wraps up this opening segment uh, of the four uh, models or theories of the universe. In our next four segments, each of the men will get a chance to just give a little uh, brief recap and then accept questions in alphabetical order from the other three men, and we will do that in a moment. All right, continuing uh, my alternative views of cosmology to the standard Big Bang model. In these next four segments, each of the men will get a chance to answer questions from the three other men. We will be going in alphabetical order. Howard Bloom will be first up. The questions will also be asked in alphabetical order. In this case, it will be Noel, Wang, and Witt. They will each ask one question at a time, and then if they have more, we will keep going around until each of them are exhausted, or we hit about the 20-minute mark. We don't have infinite room. So, Howard, Bloom, if, uh, if you're comfortable with your opening presentation, that's fine. Or if you just want to give a 20 or 30 second recap, that's also fine. Well, let's, let's give, give a recap, recap because Terry has a very involved theory of the shape of the universe. So, and mine is a little simpler. Remember, it's a big bagel theory. So the normal universe that we're accustomed to comes blasting out of the hole at the center of the bagel. The antimatter universe comes blasting out of the bottom. 
the two of them travel like a cannonball until they reach their furthest uh, from each other, and then they start speeding into each other's arms and annihilate and become the next big bagel or the next big bang. So Terry or David um, said that the Big Bang model uh, defies the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of matter and energy. Well, the Big Bagel theory does not. It's a continual oscillating energy. It's like a giant photon in operation. And a photon that travels, uh, the universe is probably something that lives and dies over the course of something like 20 billion years. Um, and Terry said that the Big Bang theory doesn't make any useful predictions. And my theory, the Big Bagel, made two useful predictions. One was inflation, and the other one was um, the dark energy, the acceleration of the universe away from itself past a certain point. Actually, the acceleration of the universe, in my theory, toward the antimatter universe drawn by gravity. So that's it. It's a very simple model. It doesn't involve any mathematics at all, although all shapes can be transformed into equations. That's what okay. uh, Descartes did. Uh, with geometry once upon a time, translated geometry into equations. All right, uh, so a first question up will be from David Noel. Uh, Howard will respond, and if David has a brief follow-up, that's okay. So David, do you have a question for Howard Bloom? No. no? Okay. <laughs> well, I got it. Sorry. <laughs> Coming out of, what was it, Oxford or Cambridge? Uh, okay. uh, I, I don't accept uh, Howard's view that uh, he, his model doesn't contribute, doesn't... Uh, go against the law of conservation of mass energy. Oh, well, tell me why. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean if, you, if you want to, to, to answer his, how his question, you can, why it doesn't violate, go ahead. But if you want to pass, I'll ask Ling Jun for a question. I'll ask Ling Jun. Okay, Ling Jun, do you have a question for Howard Bloom? Yes. Um, let me, let me um, ask uh, Howard to explain uh, something about your model. I downloaded your article with, which shows two pictures uh, of your big bag of. Now, what, what are those, uh, what, what are those axes of your big bag of? Say the axis passing through the center of your bag of. What, what is it? The axis stands for? The axis was something the artist came up with in order to give you a quick visual explanation of the theory. In fact, those axes are not included in the Big Bagel at all. It's a smooth, it's an Einsteinian space-time manifold. Um, and it comes, as I said, steeply out of the bagel at the bagel's center, levels off at the bagel's humps, and then accelerates again or uh, increases in its steepness again as it goes toward the outer rim of the bagel, but there are actually no, uh, no uh, longitudinal lines or latitudinal lines or anything of that sort. That was simply a convention that the artist used to get the idea across. Um, you, you have a correspondence of the uh, supernova expansion uh, picture to your bigger bagel, right? You got the inspiration from that. What's the correspondence? No, no, no it, that wasn't the... Inspiration. The inspiration, as I said, was the charge parity time problem, the CPT problem, which was haunting us all in theoretical physics in the late 1950s. Is there any time axis in your big bag? Of? Yes. Well, there are all spatial a, there, axis. Huh? There, there is a time axis. And which it's, one? Uh, well, now there's a difficulty there. Um, the difficulty is that we all know what direction time goes in in our universe. And the question is whether the time goes backwards. There are a lot of indications that that's the case in current theory in the universe below us, the universe that's on the underside of the bagel, the antimatter universe. So there, in all probability, according to the big bagel model, this universe is very finite. It certainly doesn't, Terry believes in a universe that has energy that's been around for a trillion years. This theory predicts an end to the universe in probably something like five billion years, a very finite amount of time, and then the emergence of a new universe. So the, the challenge for humans is, is the challenge that Stephen Hawking was debating when he was debating whether or not um, you could, uh, whether or not you could extract information from a big, uh, from a black hole. If, if I sound um, what I was saying is that uh, there was a big debate for a long time between Stephen Hawking and other, uh, a number of other physicists 
about whether you can extract any information from a black hole. Presumably the universe will end in something that's the equivalent of a black hole. And the challenge for humanity in this universe is in the four billion years or so that we've got left before the big, whatever you want to call it, uh, crunch, um, is taking everything that we know and finding a way to, to thread it through a black hole so the next universe is wiser than our universe. Okay. Sounds awesome. like science fiction, but that's a major challenge. All right. Uh, so the next question will be from Terry Witt. David, are, are you still there? Can you hear us? Yes, yes. I'm here. Okay. What? Because you're, you're, you're rotating. If you could just uh, turn off your video and turn it on again. But Terry Witt, since we have you and Howard, uh, Terry, your first question to Howard. Well, Howard and I are going to have some fun here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, Witt. Uh, hold, 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 hold on. Uh, uh, we, we... David should come back. So go ahead, Terry. Okay, so I was referring to the violation of conservation of energy. I was referring to the normal Big Bang. Um, in your theory, clearly, you had a problem with the matter asymmetry and also the conservation of energy. So, in your cyclic theory, yes, no, you're not, I agree, you're not violating energy. Um, my question is, in your process, how do you recombine the electromagnetic energy? You've got matter and energy. Matter and antimatter flying apart. Uh, so there's two issues. Well, here's why it doesn't really work very well. So you've got matter uh, flying apart on the top of the four dimensional manifold, antimatter flying, and then they're, they're combining, they're attracting and annihilating on the edge or the outer edge of your bagel. Well, the problem is you've got matter and antimatter scattered all across the surface of your bagel, and you've got electromagnetic magnetic energy scattered everywhere. So I want to know how you can get all that genie back in the bottle, number one. But part of that, I need to respond to your statement about uh, predictability. Saying something's going faster or slower is not a prediction. 1.6 kilometers per second is a prediction. Okay, but for me, a prediction in science, you put a number on it. Because then when you measure it, then you say, hey, I hit the number. So that's, that's what a prediction is for me. It's not it's going to be rainy tomorrow. How rainy? It's a specific, uh, specific thing. So that's, I'm just responding to your two things about predictability and conservation. So yeah, I agree with you. Yours does not violate conservation energy, but I want to know how you get everything back. How you get the genie back into the bottle? Well, let me make a, a statement. One of the stands out is because you have a shape of the universe. Einstein spent his whole life trying to determine the geometry of the universe, and you have a very clever geometry based on nothingness, actually. Um, and, and the big picture counts, even if the big picture hasn't been mathematicized to make tiny little predictions. The fact is, if you make a big picture prediction, and your big picture makes sense. A big picture can make an entirely new sense of the universe in which we live. So I'm a big picture person. Now, that's not to flatter myself. It means I have certain disadvantages. Um, one of my disadvantages is I wrote a whole book on the history of math. It's called The God Problem, Why Godless Cosmos Creates. But I wrote it from the perspective of, her, of a person who is illiterate with equations, really can't handle them, and as a consequence has to understand the basic metaphors underlying a mathematical, a mathematical system, system like calculus. calculus. But, but understanding those metaphors, those big picture things, those shapes of things, but my collaborator in theoretical physics at the, is at the College Institute of Applied Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Sciences. We published in Arxiborg. And Arxiborg is advanced mathematics and theoretical physics. You know that. Um, and when I talked to him, and he, math, he, math is his thing. Math is his life. And he has confessed that the only way he really understands math is by seeing the pictures. Richard Feynman understood math brilliantly, but he understood it through seeing the pictures. Big pictures count, and so do details. But without the big pictures, the details are meaningless. Without the details, the big picture is not finished. I'm just presenting a big picture. Okay. Well, no, I, I, I agree with that. <clears throat> but you, you took me to task when you said that you predict, you're predictive. So we have different interpretations of what predictive means. And I agree, the big picture is huge. My big picture is zero. Okay. And, and I go from that. But no, the real big picture is a geometry based on zero, something far more intensely intricate um, than just zero. 
So my big problem is getting the genie back in the bottle, and that's that's why. How do we get all this energy scattered across a four-dimensional manifold? Because that the surface of the manifold is three space, and I agree, you'd have those velocity gradients you're talking about with that geometry. But you need to get all that stuff back into the same density that it started with if you're going to have a cyclic system. Well, that's we'll make the annihilation of the matter universe in the outer, uh, antimatter universe on the edge. Um, you get those things and they annihilate each other, but they create an enormous blast of energy. And right, this universe. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, just, all I was going to say is the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of matter and energy, is respected in my theory, and I respect it. I take it seriously. Although, you know, we've only seen a limited amount of this universe with very limited tools, and there could be big surprises to come. But the second law of thermodynamics, that all things tend for entropy, that we're on our way to a, uh, a heat vacuum. Um, uh, okay, hold on, Howard. We, we're, getting a, we're getting a hissing sound here. David, is that you? Da David, can you? Okay. Who is that? I, I don't know. I, th I think it was coming from David. David, was that your, you hissing? Yes, uh, uh, maybe I could comment on something with uh, Terence. Oh, okay. One, one moment. Let me let, let, let me. Howard, just finish your comment. Uh, for, okay, I just uh, wanted to say that the second law of thermodynamics is absolutely ridiculous. This universe does not tend for a disorder. This universe tends in the very opposite direction toward order, complexity, flamboyance, ornateness. Um, so once you've got the, un the two universes annihilating each other in a blast of energy, what happens next? The universe starts organizing itself. The antimatter universe and the new matter universe start organizing themselves out of the universe because the second law of thermodynamics should say all things tend to organize. All right, so um, let me... Hey, Dan, just one follow-up, please. Okay. My problem is they're not annihilating, Howard. They're straight all over your, ba your bagel. The only place where the annihilation is happening is a low density, large volume on the edge of the bagel. That's what I'm saying. You've got these two fronts moving, and the annihilation is there. But you, it's, look at the universe. Look at how widely the matter is spread apart. If this, if this universe were moving against another universe, to start with, it's such low density, the matter and the end of the matter would just fly right through each other. They wouldn't even interact. That's, well, that's, that's a very good point. point. Very, it's a very, very good point. And I use the I use the trick. Oh, hold on, hold, hold on, Ling. Okay. But wow. I use the trick straight out of topology. It was the trick of the Klein's bottle. You know, where the neck of the bottle comes up and then somehow magically goes through the surface of the bottle in order to become the the the, the, the bottom. So I use that in order to say that the outer edge becomes the center once again. Now, how that happens. Is beyond me, utterly beyond me. And the okay, answer so is beyond me is what happens with time on the underside of the bag. Okay, T Terry, hold on. Let 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 Dave, Dave. Let's go back to David. You can follow well, up. Well, Wayne had a Wayne had a question. Yeah, but but Dave, David David wanted to David also had a comment, and I want to go alphabetically. David, you wanted okay. 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 Uh, well, I can see uh, what Terence's uh, difficulty is being with. Uh, now, up on. Our problem with uh, there's answers to a lot more things than uh, we've actually dealt with here. For instance, what the true origin of the cosmic microwave background radiation. But rather than opening that can of worms, uh, uh, in, the, in the papers there you'll find uh, an explanation of how the recycling of mass and energy occurs. And uh, it's... Uh, essentially, uh, the uh, supermassive black holes at the centre of galaxies, they are absorbing mass and energy and putting out a great deal of mass and energy too in the jets uh, emerge from them. Uh, those supermassive black holes are producing uh, high energy photons and also uh, uh, protons and electrons, uh, possibly starting off as uh, uh, antiprotons and proton pairs, uh, but all that great mass of energy is coming out, and that's essentially uh, the sort of, uh, that's what we perceive as the 
light from supernovas. Okay, is there a particular question then for Howard, or is, was that just a comment? Uh, hold, hold on, Terry. It's to say uh, the, that's the explanation of uh, the recycling which Terence is seeking. Okay. Yeah, we've got we're, we're kind of questions for Howard now. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, uh, okay. Let's. Do you have a, a something directed for Howard specifically, David? No. No. no? Okay. Ling Jun, you had, you had a yes, yes. follow-up. Go ahead, Ling Jun. Um, I I asked the uh, Howard what are the three axes, and he uh, couldn't respond. He was saying that the uh, you know cosmology or uh, physical theory is just a big picture, and there's no detail. Well, you don't have a big detail. You at least you can tell us what those three axes are. I think I think right? uh, that, oh, hold on, that that I have a difficult time understanding what you mean by axes, because the axes are time that the standard for the measure of axes. Like the bag we buy in the store, we know that the axes are X, Y, Z axes. But what are the three axes of your bag? Well, you know, the physics, physics theory has to be quantitative. It's not that you have just to have a picture. And you okay. don't even know what the picture stands for. Okay, so just... Uh, uh, sorry, that's not accurate. Uh, you're, you're asking me to put uh, the big bagel in a specific set of scientific terminology that you find it easy to deal with. Um, I'm sorry, we speak different languages, and we can both speak truth. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm telling you that for your axes, it's the standard three dimensions of space plus time. It's a standard Einsteinian well, method. There are four, there are four dimensions. Your bag has only three dimensions. No, so what that's is not true. Specifically, what is the axis of the, of the big bag? Yeah, I'm sorry, well, I it, do very poorly on algebra tests. Ling, uh, Ling, Ling, Ling Jun, Ling Jun, Ling Jun, hold on. Again, because you're going to despise everything I say, so fine. Yeah, Ling, Ling, Ling Jun, it, it looks uh, like you're, you're never going to connect, so let, let's let's move on, because well, I, I don't think well, Howard has an answer, so Terry, if you want to go. Hey, Jim, yeah. can I answer Ling's question? Uh, would, would you go with that, Howard? How? Yeah, I think I know what he's asking. Okay. Can I attempt? Go ahead. With Ling, uh, Ling Jun, um, his axis is the curvature. The surface of the bagel is three-dimensional space. Okay? So it's the surface. So the bagel itself is four-dimensional, and the fourth axis is time. Where? So there's no time in the, in the big bagel. Right? No. There, there is no time. It's axis. Is that right? How are they? They're only just expanding. They're not just expanding. It's the it's same as the axis, man. It's the same as in our universe. If you look at the curvature around the massive object, that curvature is in time. Okay. It's let, let, let me just say, why am I asking the question? As a matter of fact, the axis of the bagel stands for time. Yes. Okay, so you agree. Then, yep. when you pass the top and going back to me, the magnet and the magnet again, you are going back to the past of the history. No. That's what they must have done. I'm sorry. I can't. Okay, let's. Okay, let's. Okay, let, okay, let, yeah, how, Howard, oh. and, and, let, let, let Howard, if he has a response, let, let him go, and then we'll have Terry ask if he has a follow up question. Howard, do you no, have a I final really, response? I don't have much of a response. Okay. Because, uh, the, because time space manifolds are, have, have been known for a long time. When Einstein, Einstein was dealing with cosmological concept, he had a problem with it. He believed in the kind of static universe that all three of you believe in. And he couldn't make his equation for the cosmological constant hold still. The equation wanted to either become a curved universe in one direction or a curved universe in another direction. Um, and uh, what's his name? At Princeton um, said that uh, that curvature basically is uh, a matter of the fact that uh, space tells time how to, uh, or space tells matter how to move, and matter tells or the curvature tells matter how to move, and uh, matter tells space how to bend. I'm not quoting it as uh, accurately as I'd like, 
But so this concept of curvature and its relationship to motion and time um, and velocity, which is something that involves both motion, time, and distance, um, this is well known, Lane, and you are the, the master here, um, so you should know all of this. Okay, so let, let, let's just end that right there. And Terry, do you have now a, a follow-up to Howard? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to stick with the getting the genie back in the model thing. Um, so even if you're, you change your topology so that you can get your rim of the bagel, like a time bottle, back down to an infinitely small point. Okay, even if, so if we, we've got a bagel with a twist, we'll call it a strudel or whatever. The problem is you still got matter and antimatter scattered over, in, you know, very very large three dimensional space, and it's also full of energy. And you're just you're just you're just you're just you're just going to have <laughs> to take our universe and draw all drop it into a galactic black, black hole and crush it and cause another big. Bang. What I'm saying is, it's in any sort of geometry, big, big picture or small picture, this is not a cyclic process. You're going to have all this matter and energy scattered everywhere. You're going to have a bunch of energy, and if this wave comes through and you get another annihilation, because you now have changed your topology so that you can get that density you need to make sure the matter and antimatter recombine or react. Then you're just going to release more energy, but you're still going to have all the rest of the matter and animal scattered across free space, scattered across the entire surface of your bagel. Well, I so, think that's a very that's a very valid criticism, and it's not something that I have thought out, so I can't at the moment answer except for the fine bottle trick that you've accurately characterized. Okay, so let's let's leave it at that. So David d didn't have any follow-up questions. Ling, do you have any other question besides uh, anything on the axes? Well, um, yeah, uh, the next thing we might ask, where are we located on the Big Bagel right now? Well, the, the acceleration, huh? the acceleration link began, because this has recently been discovered, if you accept, uh, if you accept the interpretation of the Doppler effect, um, what's been discovered since 1998, since the discovery of dark energy, is that the universe topped out at approximately ultimately the 7 billion year mark. And since the 7 billion year mark, it's been accelerating. So what does that tell you about the, uh, the pro pro probable age the universe will reach somewhere not far from 14 billion years? We're not that far away from the crunch. Okay, so... We're about to be meet the big crunch. Well, not in our lifetimes, but uh, much sooner than is thought in standard cosmology. Standard cosmology puts that date of either a big crunch or a big drift into um, no longer being able to communicate with each other uh, at a, tr a trillion years from now. No, this says the universe is much more planet and it is coming uh, in a billion years. Okay. Two billion years. So, Ter Terry, uh, do you have a question other than any that you had previously asked something you know, that's, uh, you know. Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think my, my main concern, or I, I was able to express it. Um, eventually, there has to be um, some, something you can get your hooks in to turn it into science. Okay. And you said you've got a, a graduate student in Russia or something that can do the math. But um, my other question is, um, if the universe is as, as young as what you're describing, I mean, you're, you're changing the age of the universe substantially, right? No, oh, uh, the universe is 13.7 billion or 13.8 billion years old. That's the standard. Those two numbers are the standard numbers. Okay, so I'm sorry. So you, know, you said 7 billion years a couple of times. Well, 7 billion years is the hump of the bagel. Yeah. Okay. That's where the bagel goes over the hump. Okay. Okay. So let's let's end uh, this then uh, segment with Howard Bloom as as the question. Uh, in our next segment, we'll take a break and we'll have David Noel try to get his visual back, and we'll have David Noel fielding questions from the other three men, and we'll do that in a moment. All right, I have David Noel back on on and it is his turn to be grilled. 
will do is if David wants to give a brief recap of <laughs> his idea of the universe, we will then go, the question will go, Howard Bloom, Ling Jun Wang, and Terry Witt alphabetically. So David, do you have a brief recap? Uh, really just to say that uh, the classic universe model which I put forward is uh, essentially says that uh, everything is exactly the same on a long-term basis. Uh, all the changes we see are uh, uh, at a lower level, a closer level. Uh, the universe as a whole is unchanging and uh, infinite. All right, Howard Bloom, do you have a question for David? Well, uh, all of our different universe models uh, depend on interpretations of the Doppler effect or the redshift and whether the redshift is, in fact, the Doppler effect. Um, so what is your interpretation of the redshift? Uh, that uh, the redshift is uh, gravitational drag, as uh, suggested by Fritz Zwicky. You can show that, in fact, the redshift can't be due to the Doppler effect uh, as regards the distant galaxies and universe, because for, uh, if it's a Doppler effect, then the light from different parts of the same object which is receding must have the same redshift, and that isn't the case. If you look at the uh, uh, redshift spectra, uh, you find that the amount of shift varies with the wavelength of the, of the light. Now, that can't happen with a Doppler redshift. I mean, uh, there are Doppler shifts which occur with closed galaxies, and you can have blue shifts as well as red shifts. But with the distant galaxies, uh, you always find that uh, the redshift is not fixed for different parts of the same spectrum. And it has to be if it's Doppler. So that really rules out uh, it being a Doppler shift. Now, why does that rule out a Doppler shift? David, why it's does that rule out a Doppler shift? shift? David, he's well, asking why does that rule out a redshift? No, why does it rule out the redshift? It rules out the redshift being a Doppler. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I heard. Okay, so Ling Jun, do you have a question now for David Noel? Yes. Um, uh, I also have a question about the um, explanation of the uh, cosmic redshift. Uh, David is right that the redshift is not caused by the uh, Doppler effect. By your explanation, as due to the gravitational uh, field, may run into a you know, geocentric theory. Because how can you how, how can you explain the correlation between redshift and the distance of the heavenly body uh, to the Earth? Well, it's uh, <laughs> it's just uh, an effect of gravity. Uh, the the further the light travels, the more energy is extracted from it. No, uh, no, that, that, that's not right. Even uh, though we just say it's not right. Yeah, uh, uh, let, so Vicky, let him ask. Vicky point, pointed all this out at the beginning of the whole redshift business in the 1930s, and he did the maths for it, and you'll find the references to that uh, up, up on my site. Uh, okay, so it looks like David has answered that. Let's move on. Terry Witt, do you have a question for David Noel? A uh, couple comments. Uh, you're absolutely right, David, on all counts. Quiescent, infinite, and um, in pretty much steady state. Uh, really, the only difference I see with our theories is I've quantified it by using some of the astronomical and the cosmological evidence that I've been able to measure stuff. And by doing that, certain processes and certain other things that have appeared. Um, one problem, so I, you know, I really just, just generally agree. Uh, except, you know, you have, like you said, you you've got the development into a full science, into a full cosmology, but um, 
So, you, so the, 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 I guess I, I, I'm babbling, but um, do you have a reason other than the appearance of the universe? Do you have like an underlying first principle about why the universe is quiescent and not not changing, or are you just going off basically its appearance? Oh, it is such a basic matter of logic, really. Uh, uh, in, in a way, uh, I'm saying that you don't need any theory. You just assume things are as they were. And you have to find a reason why that isn't so, why the universe is expanding or not expanding. Now, you, the, the reasons put forward for expanding uh, uh, are first the redshift thing, which I uh, say so you can... Sh which I have shown is not due to Doppler effect. The other thing, of course, is the cosmic back microwave background radiation, um, which uh, has recently appears to be uh, a, a normal uh, uh, black body radiation or second volts of radiation uh, from uh, matter between the stars, uh, uh, which normally isn't visible, but... Uh, uh, it's just at the right temperature to produce the cosmic back microwave background radiation. Okay. There's, there's more to it than that, but uh, you'll find that uh, uh, finely distributed matter between the stars uh, is at about up to 1.7 degrees K, or 2 percent K, and uh, that is the peak of the microwave background radiation. So, it looks as though the cosmic microwave background radiation is just ordinary thermal radiation, which you'd expect from uh, black body stuff at that temperature. Okay, uh, Howard Bloom, do you have a, uh, another question for David? I, I do have another question. Um, back in 1955, when I was meeting with the head of the graduate physics department at the University of Buffalo, Fred Hoyle, and I may have my ear off by a year or two, but Fred Hoyle, uh, and George Gamow were both on the west coast of the United States. And Gamow kept calling Fred Hoyle and asking him to come down where he was because he was doing consultancy for General Dynamics. He had just bought himself a great big white Cadillac that he didn't have the money to pay for. And if he didn't keep working every single hour, he wasn't going to get enough money to pay for it. And the two of them were arguing about the uh, background radiation and its temperature. Both agreed that there should be a cosmic background radiation. And the guy who had the more accurate prediction was not George Gamow. George Gamow, of course, was the great uh, champion of Big Bagel Theory. I mean, Big, ba Big Bang Theory, sorry. Um, the person who had the most accurate prediction was Fred Hoyle. Now, Fred Hoyle had a steady state theory of the universe in which you got these spots in the universe that he called something like creative zones, and they're just pouring out hydrogen all the time. So how does your theory differ from the steady state universe theory of the 1940s and 1950s? Well, uh, Fred Hoyle's theory, uh, the steady state theory, does assume that the universe is expanding. But to counteract uh, that, uh, he uh, postulated the uh, spontaneous formation of hydrogen uh, right. to fill up the gaps. Well, uh, my view is that uh, you do, there's no expansion, and so there's no need to have. Uh, that's okay. Uh, uh, that, sure. that looks like it. Makes sense. Sense. Thanks. 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 Uh, okay. Okay. It look. It looks like we uh, lost uh, Ling Jun. Uh, yeah. Oh, he's coming back. Okay. But, uh, uh, the Placid Universe is simpler than either of either of them. And it assumes that things are as they were and uh, as they will be. Okay. Ling Jun how Wang. How does the Placid Universe exist? Okay. How does the Placid Universe. I, 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 hold, hold on, hold on. Ling oh. Jun, you, you, just, you just dropped off. I was just making sure. Okay, we got you back. Howard, just finish your statement and then we'll go to Ling's okay. question. Okay. How does the Placid Universe uh, differ from the Null Universe that Terry has generated? It has some similarities. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, Terry Terence has said that uh, he mostly uh, uh, agrees with the views, uh, or in fact, at least with that, our views are, are pretty close. His is just uh, uh, has got more 
sort of uh, mathematical cladding, perhaps. Okay, so let's 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 move on. Ling Jun, do you have another question for David Noel? Well, I agree with uh, his uh, notion of a classic uh, universe, uh, an optimized universe. But the explanation of the cosmic redshift um, is not correct because when when you move through a gravitational field, when you move into the lower potential place, uh, and then you come back to, to the place of higher potential, all your red shift and the full shift are the kinds of. So unless you have a global gravitational center, otherwise you cannot explain why the red shift is proportional to the distance. Is there a, is there a, is there a question there? I... Well, yeah. uh, okay, let, let me just go ahead, David. What Lincoln has said is the common assumption, uh, but it is not correct. Uh, light is affected by gravity, as is well accepted, with uh, uh, gravitational lensing and with uh, the gravitational redshift when uh, light is emitted from an object and it loses energy that moves away. Now, uh, uh, let, let me just, uh, before we go to Terry's question, just for the lay people out there, it seems to me that what you're saying, since light is known to bend, you are saying that uh, that, that the ability to, to be bent around a, gra a large gravity field also sort of slowly leaches some of the power of light, so that over time and distance, going around many different objects, the light would basically lose that the redshift is. I forget there was an old term uh, uh, with redshifts that it's a, a. It's basically a weakening of the light every time it passes around a large gravitational field. Is that a lay person could understand something like that, David? Is that what your explanation is? Yes, but it's not really my explanation. Yeah. I mean, uh, you've incorporated. You didn't. You didn't come up with it, but you've incorporated it. Common phenomenon was applied. Was uh, tired. Tired light. Tired light, yeah, that was the, yeah. yeah. But it was looked at fundamentally by a brilliant uh, astronomer called Fritz Zwicky at the time the redshift was first being examined. And he showed uh, mathematically uh, the, the basic behind it, and he actually had uh, the theory, uh, the, the measurements. Uh, uh, the magnitude effect looked at by astronomers and it agreed with him that it was due to gravitational drag. Uh, okay. Slowly the light is slowed down. All right. So, uh, uh, Terry. Okay. So the light okay. is not, sorry, that's wrong. The light is not slowed down. It slowly uses a little bit of its energy. Yeah. So it, it's fact, le leached there off. Is what's called the Twicky constant, which is the distance at which. Light has lost half its energy, and that is somewhere around 7.8 billion years. Okay, so Terry Witt, do you have another question? Oh, uh, just a quick comment. Um, yeah, if you look at in terms of this light, this tired light that the brilliant Fritz Wicke predicted, um, if you look at the average curvature, you know, we're talking about. Um, if you like space like a rim crumpled blanket, if you look at the average curvature based on the amount of material that's in space, then you do get the uh, magnitude of the redshift that we see. So uh, what I'm trying to say is not only this a, a qualitative aspect, but it, it can actually be quantified, and that's that's what they did. But it wasn't quite as exciting as the big thing exploding billions of years ago, and so. Uh, and they also claim that the redshift didn't cause the signal broadening, even though it does. So, uh, so yeah, and Chris, yeah, Chris, how did it go on? Okay. Uh, Howard Bloom, do you have another question for David? No, I, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, so it looks like you and Terry are done. Ling, do you have another question for David other than oh. something about that? Okay, so it looks like then we finished the questioning for this round, and we will take a break when we get back. Ling Jun Wang will then field questions from the other three men, and we'll do that in a moment. All right, I'm back, and in this segment, Ling Jun Wang will be the man to field questions from the others. He has requested to have a minute or two just to recap 
his theory. So Ling Jun, if you could go ahead. Okay. Uh, my theory is a theory about the um, interpretation of Hubble law. The key question is to ban or not to ban. That is the question. And the key rests on the interpretation of Hubble law. We know Hubble law is a roughly linear, uh, linear relationship between the redshift and the distance of the heavenly body from the Earth. Now, the question is how to interpret this phenomenon. If we interpret it as due to the recessional motion of the heavenly body, so inevitably you write into the conclusion that the universe is expanded, and then you have Big Bang. However, if the real cause for the redshift is due to the interaction of the light coming from the heavenly body with the space medium, and then you cannot conclude that the universe is expanded. Infinite stable universe. The DET theory is based on well, understand, well understood the, the physics of light material interaction. There's no ad hoc hypothesis. There's no postulation. And we can witness this in everyday life. The sky is blue. Why? Because the blue component is scattered more than the red component. The sun is redder in the morning and the evening. Why? Because it has a longer light path uh, through by glancing at the Earth. And we also know a well understood phenomenon in actual physics that's called the star reddening. And this is a well understood uh, phenomenon experimentally and theoretically. Even the galaxies will look red when it's farther away from us. So all this back up the uh, interpretation of the um, uh, red shift as due to the interaction or is, is caused in the process of propagation. Now, DT also predict new physics. That is, the cosmic red shift is not only dependent on the distance, but also proportional to square of the line width and inversely proportional to the cube of the wavelength. And these new physics are experimentally verifiable. It can be used to either vindicate or falsify DET versus BBT. Okay. Now, uh, what, yeah. go ahead. why do we need an alternative uh, um, explanation or alternative interpretation of the cosmic redshift? Because the other interpretation would lead to a theory that has many fundamental issues, fundamental inconsistencies, and paradoxes. Even Hubble himself did not like that interpretation. But that, that the double shift was the only mechanism he knew. If DET was published in 1920, he would adopt the DET theory instead of the double shift. But the history took its own prerogative to allow the Big Bang theory to dominate actual physics. Okay, uh, so uh, with having said that, uh, let's go alphabetically. Howard Bloom, do you have a question for Ling Jun? Just it seems to me that uh, Ling's interpretation of dispersive um, dispersion and extinction, in other words, scattering, he says in one of his papers, as the explanation for the redshift makes a great deal of sense for at least part of the red shift and seems totally consistent with what Terry believes. Terry believes in a form of that. Okay, I've got it wrong, so you have to explain the difference to me. Okay. And, and David believes in that, that all of this is caused by the gravitational red shift, by gravitational forces. One way or the other, what you call the space medium, dispersion by the space medium is something that all three of you seem to agree about. But to a mind as naive as mine, they seem very similar to each other. But Terry sees a big difference. Well, do you have a specific question for Ling Jun? Yeah, I'm curious about what. It's, I'm actually curious about what Terry sees is the difference between his interpretation well, the, 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 your, and your, Ling's. Your, your, okay, but this is lit, you're asking. So ask. So you're asking 
how does Ling's disp uh, dispersion of, of light and the red shift differ from Terry Witt's? I don't know right, if he, exactly. he knows enough about Terry's to say that, but Ling, if you want to answer how it about, about that. Well, I guess uh, how what uh, pointed out in the uh, uh, difference between our interpretation of uh, cosmic redshift correctly. Um, my interpretation is based on where understood the physics, the interaction of light and the material. The extinction includes both absorption and scattering. Yeah, Terry's. Ex uh, Terry's explanation of the redshifts sounds very much like a child of light theory, right? And, and as to David's uh, explanation, uh, I already you know, quest asked questions. Unless you have a uh, global or universal gravitational center, otherwise uh, the uh, explanation of gravitational redshift will not work, will not yield the linear relationship between redshift and distance if you go into the quantitative analysis. Well, I can answer that. Is, is it my turn? Uh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Hold, hold, hold on, hold on. No, if they, David, they, David Noel is the next one with question. David, do you have a question for Ling Jun Wang? Yes. Uh, Ling Jun, uh, can I say that we're all pretty much in agreement that the redshift uh, cosmic redshift is caused uh, by some feature of space as light passes through it, which is proportional to the distance that the light has travelled. Is, is that fair enough? So yeah, yes. we're really only arguing as to the mechanism by which the light is uh, <coughs> uh, reduced in wavelength. Are we all in agreement with that? We're just really arguing as to the cause. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Well, right, with the exception yeah. of me, because I'm uh, the, basically the big bad person. Actually, the distance is a proportional to what we call the optic uh, thickness, but it does not correlate to any gravitational center at all. And as uh, I said, if you, if you go into quantitative <laughs> analysis, you'll find a hard time to, to yield a linear correlation between redshift and the distance. If we insist that that's caused by gravitational acceleration, by gravitational field. Okay, so, ba basic, so basically David, three. Terry, and Ling are in agreement that, that the Doppler shift is not the cause of red light. Howard disagrees. It's incorrect. You're okay. right. So I agree with that. Okay, so Terry, do you now have a question for Ling Jun? Oh, you bet I do. Uh, <laughs> Okay, Ling Jun, uh, your dispersion you're talking about is just basically scattering, right? Scattering and absorption. Scattering and absorption. So, extinction. Okay, so that's the problem right here. The scattering and absorption cannot cause the redshift because scattering is just that. <laughs> when you have scattering to conserve momentum, you're changing the direction of the photons. So you don't get photons that are pointed at Earth anymore. You get photons that are spread across space. Yeah, we can see images from a billion light years away where you can see galactic arms of the galaxy. Okay, so scattering, that's why scattering doesn't work. And then your, your prediction, you're saying that there's a frequency or a wavelength dependence on the system that you're predicting. Well, in fact, your prediction has already been, has already failed because that's how we measure redshift. If you look at the calcium lines or the oxygen lines, you have a pattern. It's like a fingerprint in the absorption spectrum. If, if the redshift was caused by scattering, what you'd see is a, is a wavelength dependence in that, where now the pattern between the lines has changed, and we don't see that. So you've made a prediction for which data is already available that causes your theory to fail. And quickly, now, while you're true, you, the gravitational center that you're referring to David, um, in David's uh, information, he mentioned gravitational potential. Okay, that's true. Gravitational potential causes a redshift. What I'm talking about, and I think what David may have needs to read, or what 
uh, he needs to rework is it's not gravitational potential. It does not require a gravitational. It is an additional effect. It is in addition to, yes, if you, if you shine light from point A to point B, same potential, no redshift. Shine it up, you get a redshift. No, this is an additional gravitational light interaction that we're talking about. So my question to you is, how do you get an image from a billion light years away that is scattered? Uh, the light is no longer pointed at us. It has been scattered to conserve momentum. Ling, do you have Sorry. any? Yeah. Yeah, the question is how do you account for how do you how do you fix the angular problem? The conservation of momentum says scattering, a loss of energy or absorption scatters light. We see great images from great distances. Okay. So how do you account for that? You finish? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. First, the light that we see are the surviving component of the light beam. They're also scattered and absorbed, are not seen. Does that answer your question? That you said the line dependence, a uh, line width dependence and the wavelength dependence are proven wrong. That's not true. That has never been realized. In the past, when people measure redshift, they didn't realize that the redshift they will be dependent on line width and wavelength. So, so they simply average out. Now, I, I ducked out the uh, data from the measurements. No such analysis on the redshift and line dependence and uh, redshift and uh, wavelength dependence ever been reported. And now there are people, now I have some folks in uh, Austria who are trying to come up with the experiment and test my theory. So that's what I meant. My theory, it's a falsifiable. It's not something that you could never check experimentally. No, no, I agree. What I'm saying is your theory is falsifiable. I'm saying the data that's already there falsifies it, falsifies it now. And I'm not saying line width. I'm saying line spacing. If you look at a calcium or an oxygen spectrum, there is a proportional spacing between different wavelengths, okay? And if you had the wavelength dependence of the scattering and you apply it to that, the proportions get messed up. You, can't even, you wouldn't even be able to recognize calcium anymore. Secondly, if the light that we see is the surviving light that's not scattered, then why is it redshifted? Well, because the, the um, extinction is not constant. It's, it's uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, dispersive. The, as I said, the, the red component is extinguished more than the co red component. And therefore, the peak of the Gaussian is shifted by the time it gets to the Earth. It's exactly the same phenomenon that we see. The farther the, the star, the redder it looks. The same phenomenon we witness and it's well understood. And this is same thing uh, for, for the galaxy. The farther the galaxy is located, the more reddish it looks. Okay. And that's a solid proof that the blue component is extinguished more than the red component. Okay, so let's, let, let Terry, let's, let's, let's let you, if you, you can follow up in a, a minute or let's, let's have to have, Howard, do you have a, another question for Ling Jun? Uh, no, I find this uh, dialogue with Terry to be very valuable. Okay. David Noel, do you have another question for Ling Jun? Uh, <coughs> uh, only really to uh, ask, aren't we all getting closer and closer together in our views and really just uh, the details <coughs> uh, are where we're differing? You mean the three of you, Noel, Witt, and Wang, how it is the outlier? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying we're really talking very much about the same uh, conclusions. Uh, we're just arguing about the fringes, uh, what yeah. color they are. Yeah, ba well, basi uh, basically, Ling, David is saying that the, he, Terry, and you are, are in, in a more general agreement than with Howard. So it's basically just oh, details. Well, Correct. we all believe that the universe is not expanded. Yeah. That I yeah. think, is that fair to say? 
Well, yeah, yes. that's fair to but say. We are, we, are, we are obliged to explain the cosmic redshift, and the explanation is different among three of us. Okay. Right. So, Terry, do and you have a I'm final saying, question? Go ahead, Terry. Yeah, what, yeah, what I'm saying, Dan, it, the difference is, diff is important, though, because we're coming up against the Big Bang, and things need to be quantified, things need to be able to be predictable. I mean, the whole point um, of what I would hope the process is, is, is to eventually supplant a theory that's wrong. And in order to do that, we need to be right about the details too. And I agree we can argue about this, but what I don't, you know, what I don't agree is, you know, if you're wrong, you're wrong. And um, yes, uh, in fact, if, if, you, if you look in the color spectrum of distant galaxies, you don't see reddening because of dispersion, you actually see bluing. And that's the color evolution. That's one of the supporters or supports of the Big Bang is that, oh, well, back in the day, we've got younger and younger, bluer and bluer galaxies. But the, the point still remains that if this light came and is arriving and has lost, energy is lost by scattering, we're not going to see it. It's going to be, it's going to have a change in direction. And it's like looking through, if you look through someone with a shower curtain or a fog and you see a light, yes, you're going to lose the whole glow around it. But photons you do see, when they get there, those are the ones that are not scattered. And so there's no way for those to have lost energy. Okay, so... Well, I, I, do, I do have one tiny question for Ling. Okay. And that is in the dispersion um, model, um, what is extinction? Extinction includes absorption and scattering. Okay. Two um, processes. So far, that's what we know. Okay. So, um, let me... The extinction is okay. not uniform over the whole spectrum. It's, it's dependent on frequency. The extinction is greater for the blue light than for the red light. <clears throat> and if you look at the astronomical data, it's almost linear, roughly linear, over the spectrum that they observe. And what does the term line width mean when you're referring to line width? Line width means well, any spectral line. Many, many uh, people got a uh, misunderstanding that a spectral uh, line is a single frequency. That's not right. Any real spectral line is a Gaussian curve. The frequency basically, theoretically, covers from zero to infinity. Now, the Gaussian curve can be narrow, can be uh, uh, fat. So we define what we call the line width, which is basically 70% uh, of the peak value for the uh, electric field. And we define that as the line width. Okay, so it has nothing to do with the spectral lines uh, that you see when you're analyzing the light from a given star? Well, well, it depends on the source. For instance, quasars are known to have very, very large language, very wide. Which means they cover a very large part of the spectrum. Yes, yes, you're right. And a smaller line width would cover a smaller part and of that the spectrum. Could be, that could be partially explaining why the quasars tend to have a larger redshift. And Terry because disagrees. Redshift, according to DET, is proportional to square of the line width. Okay, so Terry disagrees with this. Um, uh, Howard, the line width, think of this absorption. Now, you've got a hot object, right? And you've got a specific energy that's getting absorbed. Well, a hot object does have a Gaussian distribution of material in there. So depending on the motion of that material that's emitting or, or absorbing the energy, you're getting, the line is not going to be one exact energy. That is going to be, it's going to be thickened by the kinetic content of whatever is emitting or whatever is absorbing the energy. And this is well known. What I've been talking about is the distance between these lines, not the thickness of the lines. Now the distance of the lines is characteristic of certain types of atoms. So you, that's why you get these nice mass spectrographs and they hit things with a high energy pulse and then you get this characteristic pattern that has the proportional distance between two states. And that's, a, that's calcium, that's iron, that's whatever. And that's what we're looking at when we look at these things. 
Okay. So it uh, it looks like David, Howard, and Terry have all asked their questions. Am I correct? I think so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me let me just uh, uh, clarify something for any lay or young viewers, and let me just myself ask Ling a, a question because since this since Ling's segment basically was devoted uh, mostly to uh, redshift and scattered light and that kind of thing, uh, Terence Witt seemed to have objected to the idea of scattered light uh, uh, because he 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 said that redshift couldn't be accounted for that. I'm assuming this is something analogous to what he had mentioned earlier about Olber's paradox, which is that if there are all these stars out of here, the scattered light, the redshift, the scattered light from one star might be scattered, but the star that's next to it and the star next to it, its light would be scattered too. So it would, it would the scattered, uh, the, the maintenance, the, the redshift would be the same since one star's scattered light would intrude into another's. Again, I'm asking as a layman, does that have something to do with Olber's paradox? And is that your basic objection, Terry, to Ling's, uh, Ling's idea? Oh, is that a question for me? Well, yeah, yeah, and then I, I'll direct it to him. I, it, it, was that your... Oh, okay, your... yeah. So the thing with the uh, paradox is it's a, an energy flow. It doesn't have anything to do with scattering. It's just stars pumping energy into space and space getting hot. Yeah, I, so, I know. But let, let's assume we had a universe with just one star. And, and, and as its light came a billion light years, it, you're saying you're saying that it would it would slowly diffuse out, and you don't you don't think that's correct. But if you have a universe full of stars, each of their diffusions would sort of sort of mesh into one another, and you wouldn't get the red shift. I'm, I'm, is that is that what your your contention is as why Ling's wrong? No, uh, my con my contention is you're shooting a. He's saying that the light is going through this material. And it's losing energy by interacting with material. What I'm saying is there's consequences to losing that energy through that mechanism. Okay. You can't, you know, we, the thing is with the redshift is pristine. We get these pristine images of galaxies from very distant. And if it was actually running through material and losing its energy that way, it, it would be like what you're saying. You have photons coming from different stars, then all of a sudden, they're scattered just so that they all show up at Earth in a beautiful image of a galaxy. Okay. Uh, Ling Jun, do you have a comment then, a final comment to what Terry just said and, okay. and, and my question? So, uh, then apparently you uh, didn't quite understand what Terry was uh, yeah. asking, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, let me go back to Terry's uh, question. Now, first I would correct the, uh, the concept. Terry was saying that the scattering of photon, and that would reduce the energy of the single photon. But my theory is simply based on well-tested classical electrodynamics of Maxwell's theory. It's a reduce, the, the light will reduce the intensity. I, I do not need to involve the concept of photon. Okay. So that's the one thing I need to clarify. Secondly, the clear image you see is different from the accurate measurement of, red, of the red shift. For instance, you can see a very clear image of the moon, but it doesn't mean you can measure very accurately the red shift of light from the moon. These are completely different concepts. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that because as I said, this is on YouTube, so there will be uh, uh, lay viewers watching. So thank you very much, Ling. And uh, in our final uh, Q&A segment uh, coming up next, Terry Witt will be the subject, and we'll do that in just a moment.